Table Football Monthly. Don't mind if I do. Hello, hello, and welcome to the bumper Christmas edition of Table Football Monthly, our last programme of 2019. And boy, has it gone quickly. Now, do not worry, the approach of the transfer window has not led to Smithy and Danielle being poached by Real Madrid and looking at pastures new. No, they're over in the corner of the studio getting ready to do the draw for last month's competition. Over to you, chaps. Uh, hey, Smithy. Hello, right, girl. How are you? I'm good, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Anyway, last month we asked you who knocked Brazil at the 1982 World Cup in Spain. And the answer, of course, was Italy. Loads of entries. A trailer for, oh, a huge wonderful. trailer for. Excellent. We're thrilled to have Action Man here today. He's in charge of security, so Danielle, you're covered. Brilliant, thank you. Let's have a little rummage. Yeah. Let's see, and the building. winner is Roland Lyons. Well done, Roland. Well done, you. A new Subutio England versus Brazil set will be on its way to you, Roland. Congratulations. Back in July, I did a comparison between Subutio floodlights. One in original configuration, the other converted to take three AA batteries. Today, however, we have two sets of brand new floodlights that I am really excited about, and I promise you now, both are fantastic. In this corner, we have four lights from Tipkick, six LEDs, and they run off three AA batteries. In the opposing corner, we have four floodlights from SubutioStadium.com in Holland. These have 32 LEDs, are USB charged, and are made of aluminium. Uh, the light will last just over two hours. So, the first thing that will be obvious to you is that Subutio Stadium's floodlights are taller. These will reach over and shine over a Subutio grandstand. Sadly, the tip kick floodlights won't. They'll easily shine over terracing as we'll see in a minute but if you have a fully diorama pitch with stadia these are not going to work for you the other issue that may affect your final decision a set of four of the tip kick uh, from subutio world which is where i got mine will cost you the best part of 30 pounds and they work very well these they are made by an individual trader so are therefore more expensive they're quite heavy and sturdy and aluminium and impressively they have four screw holes in the bottom how many times have we knocked floodlights off a table these can be screwed into place but the price of all of that is going to be around about 118 120 pounds there's your details let's turn off the light and have a look now now here i am hidden behind these searchlights you'll see straight away with the 32 leds that the subutiostadium.com floodlights are significantly brighter. I've got them all pointing downwards so there isn't too much glare. Whereas the ticket ones with the six LEDs are not quite so bright. But believe me, they still work. So I think the best thing we can do is stick them on a table and have a look at them in action. Here we have the tip kick floodlights peering over Subutio Terracy. And I think we can agree they're significantly better than Subutio floodlights. There are a couple of issues. The fact that they're lower than traditional Subutio and Subutio Stadium floodlights means they're not getting, they're not shining their light above the play. So they do cast shadows. The other thing is you tend to get spotlighting where the light is focused. But I can still see to play. Let's have a look. And you could easily play a game under these lights. Here we are with the SubutioStadium.com lights. I've kept the same camera angle and I've put 
the floodlights in exactly the same place. Hopefully you can see as clearly as I can that there is already a difference. I can more easily tell which team is which and I'm sure there is more illumination. And I can certainly see what I'm doing. But then that is 32 LEDs against six and a rather sizable price difference. But I like these, I think they work well. The tip kick floodlights come with a very useful swivel feature, allowing you options with how you fit the floodlight to the side of your pitch. That rather jolly review of floodlights shines a light on this month's competition. If you would like to be the owner of four tip kick floodlights, here they are in front of you. They are rather splendid. Two of them are switched on and you can see how bright they are. Then all you have to do is answer this question. Who is the gentleman in this photograph? He was, in his time, a successful and well-known footballer. He went on to become an even better known manager. If you think you know who that is, send your answer to this email. Try to do so by January the 18th, and we will pull a winning entry from some object we find lying around the studio. If your name is pulled out, then these will be yours, brand new and courtesy of our very generous chums at Sabucho World. Got to be worth a bash. A few weeks ago, Bristol Sabucho Club and Cardiff Bluebirds Sabucho Club invited us down to Bristol to present some awards. Now, sadly, we couldn't make the diaries match, but with it being the season of goodwill, we got our heads together and decided to invite them over to the studio for a bit of a wander about, put on a buffet, and when we realised there were three English players and three Welsh players, well, it would have been impolite not to organise a little bit of a challenge. Yes, that's right, but not before we presented some awards. Division 2 League Champion goes to Matthew Rowley. The Retro League Champion Trophy goes to Aaron Skinner. And the Division 3 Cup winner goes to Bernard O'Connor. And the Bristol Sibutio FA Cup goes to Darren Barnes. Well done to all the winners. That was great. Then we dived into our challenge. We had England versus Wales. Three different disciplines on three different tables. Yes. And I got to look after table one. On table one, the challenge is crown green bowls. Three shots each and the highest combined score wins. Like bowls, knocking your opponent's player out of the way or using them for a ricochet is allowed. First up for the English team, Bernard O'Connor. <laughs> Nicely placed, Bernard. One scored. First for the Welsh team, Darren Barnes. In the spirit of Christmas, we'll allow three points for that one. Although it's dodgy. Bernard, England, shot two. Bernard, now we've shot two. A flex of the magic fingers. Oh, that has fallen short. A chance now for Darren to pull further ahead. Another spin. Right, 
This is exciting. Final round. Bernard for England. Bernard needs either a good score or to bounce down his three scoring player out of the target circle. Oh no! He's gone too long! Should be a formality. Darren for Wales, last shot. The England lads winding Darren up. Here we go. Final shot of round one. Great spin. Not only a point scored, but Bernard's single point score are removed from the circle. Great shot. Final score, Wales five, England nil. Table two, a shot from between the shooting line and the penalty area, score without your player entering the net. Right now, table two. This could be tricky. First up for Wales, Matt Rowley. Goal! Great shot. One out of one. Shot two, just inside the shooting zone. Two out of two, great goal. <laughs> Can Matt make it three? Oh, no! He's off the post! <laughs> on table two, up for England, Aaron Skinner. Come on, Aaron! Come on! Aaron's going from close in. Goal! One out of one! Shot two for Aaron. He's taken a long run up. Oh, he's back. Two out of two, great goal. Two out of two. Aaron, sticking close to the box. He's hit the post. Oh. Two each, all the twos on table two. On table three, simply score a five-a-side goal from the halfway line with your player not entering the D. We're on table three. John will be taking the shot for Wales. Gavin will be defending with the keeper for England. Gentlemen. Ready? <coughs> yes! Oh. yes. Right, for the first English shot on table three, it's Gavin with John in goal for Wales. Chaps. On Wales. Oh. Yeah! Oh. Gavin leads, 1-0 for England. Second shot, John to shoot for Wales, Gavin in goal. Go on, John. Go on, John. Oh! oh. oh. Round three, still with the score, 1-0 for England. Gavin, second shot. John, you need to save this. When you're ready. No, no. Ready. Oh! oh and we on the line, keeper, please. If I had my yellow card in my pocket. <laughs> right. Final shot for Welsh John. Am I allowed to call you Welsh John? You are. Yeah, final shot for Welsh John. Don't want to put the pressure on John, but you need a goal. Good luck. And the same to you, Gavin. Go. Ready? Go on, go on, go on, go Oh! 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 And you didn't go in the box. Well, I'm John. England. Leading by one goal, have this round in the bag. But for the total scores, Gavin could really do with getting this. And John could really do with getting his gloves on it. <laughs> Chaps. Oh. Yeah! Come on, yes. Yes. Two nil right. Round one, shot from between a win, draw and loss for both sides. Wales lead on goal difference. For round two, the players switch tables. On table one, a dramatic last shot for Wales from Matt makes a result one all. On table two, Gavin beats John for a 3-2 England win. Whilst Bernard and Darren fight out a one all draw on the five-a-side table. Going in to the last round, Wales lead nine points to six. England have Gavin to thank for a 5-1 victory over John on table one. Controversy on table two as Darren checks the paperweight is in the middle of the goal. But the only number that really matters is Bernard wins, 3-0 for England. So the last round of the match with England leading 12-9 with a superior goal difference. Very clean, very clean. <laughs> <laughs> right, the pressure's on you to equalise that. Aaron, you're in goal, old chap. Right, no doubt about that, right in the corner. 
putting all the pressure on Matt. But then you've got broad shoulders, haven't you, Matt? Very. Very. This is it then. Matt's first shot. Here we go. Straight goalkeeper, please. Straight. And you can come just off the white. That's no, it. Straight. Straight, straight, straight. That's it. Cool. When you're ready. Oh, he's oh, oh, dug himself. We can't, yeah, that's, that's the, the area. area. It's in the area. It went out. That's a really weird one. That counts, and that's yours. Yeah, he's in the area. I'll tell you what, well, chaps, I think just because we want to demonstrate to this beautiful world, we're a friendly lot, can we play that as a let? Get lost. Because he wasn't in the area, he was airborne. Right. Thanks, chaps, that makes life a lot easier. Shot one, again, format. Here we go. Straight. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. same corner, one <laughs> each. This is tight. Right, Matt between the sticks. Aaron. Remember, a draw will see victory for England. So, come on, Matt. You need to save this. Here we go. Oh, same oh, corner, oh, same oh, corner. Oh, Matt read it, Matt read it. So, one all for goals. But Matt can put Wales 2-1 up. Is he going to go to the favourite corner? We'll soon find out. It's going to be your guess. Aaron in goal. Straight, straight, straight. Straight. Ooh, when you're ready, though. Here we go. No! <laughs> Two one Wales, yeah? yeah. Okay. But just before you go. Matt's put Wales 2-1 into the lead. Aaron needs this to draw level. It's his final shot and England's final shot of the competition. Gentlemen, when you're ready. Yes. Oh! oh! Right, victory for Wales. We might need the goal <laughs> difference, Matt. Go on, Aaron, you need to save this just in case. Oh, it goes I'm the goal difference. I can't believe it's this level. Right, the final shot of the competition. Scores are level. At 12 all, it's going to come down to goal difference. Straight up, straight, flat. Oh, yeah, on the floor, so keep on the floor. Right, here we go. When you're ready. Moving. Who would have believed we'd have ended up with such a close finish in this challenge? We certainly had no idea when we set it up earlier today. We've got to say a major thanks to both sets of players for entering into the spirit of the game for nearly, well, the best part of a minute. The finish was so close, we've been locked away in a room with our calculators and an abacus uh, and other magazines. And we found out there is a difference between the two teams. On the points front, Wales 12, England 12. On the goal difference front, England 17, Wales 15, for our first national challenge, England are pronounced the winners! <laughs> the product review I'm about to do now is one I promised I would do after our August edition. And it comes from one of the legendary names in toys and games manufacture in the UK. And that's John Waddington's of Leeds. They are probably best known for the board game Monopoly, an international icon, first published way back in 1935. In 1943, we first saw Cluedo, the detective board game, another global icon. But it was in 1965 that John Waddington's decided to dip their toes into the murky waters of tabletop football. And they did so with this, Waddington's Table Soccer. So let's get the lid off and have a rummage about. The game is accurately illustrated on the front of the box. Here we have Dad in his fine V-neck jumper. And here, I think his son copying Dad's hairstyle and also sharing his passion for quality knitwear. This chap though, clearly a mid-60s rebel, hair getting a bit long and a roll neck jumper. That's what we like to see. Right, in the box, we have a cardboard pitch which the groundsman has kept in excellent condition. We love those stripes. And inside on the orange inlay card, we have the relatively straightforward rules for the game. The teams come in the ubiquitous for the period, blue and red. And this disc that is used as a ball will indicate its origins and lineage come from Tiddlywinks. 
The goals are plastic, they clip on to the cardboard pitch and uh, look a little bit like hockey goals. Right, let's get this laid out and see how it all works. You'll be thrilled to know that the rules to Waddington's table soccer are really simple, which means I can play with me good friend Smithy Thank here. Thank you very much. The underlying rule to this game is that possession belongs to the team nearest the ball at all times, so you've got to look after it. I'm blue, I'm in defence, and currently the ball or the disc is with me. So I can play a little pass to my centre back. Now what I'm going to try and do is ping it out to my wide midfielder. Lovely, close enough. Yeah. Now one of the options I have after I've passed the ball is I can move two players. Now my attack is a little bit thin, so I'm going to get a wide man and I think we'll do the inside channel. Nice. And as I'm a defending team, I'm allowed to move two as well, hopefully to block him from getting near my goalkeeper. One of the rules similar to Sabucho is you can dribble with the ball three times. Now Smithy has deserted his midfield. I think you call it park the bus, son. He's <laughs> parked the bus. Park the so bus. that means I can dribble, he can't move, I've no. got the pitch to myself, so hopefully I can improve the position for a pass as long as the disc stays nearest my team. Well, he's nowhere to be seen, no. so that's easy. I've got a wide player I could aim for, I've got a wide player here, and I've got the yeah. coolest through ball to me inside, uh, inside forward. Can we do it? Yes. Oh, you are in trouble. Oh, here we now, go. Now, finally, yeah. similarly to Sabucho, the tension's building. Yes, yes. The shooting line is represented by the crease in the pitch. I am inside the shooting line. Now, this is such a well-mannered game mm. that I am not allowed to shoot unless I inform my opponent that I'm going to do so. You I'm going to shoot. Thank you. And I'm now allowed to move my goalkeeper into a position that's not going to let him score, hopefully. I'll right. just adjust that. No edits on this, this is no. it. No, Gordon, son, do I your work. I fancy this. Come on. Oh, oh bottom what? corner! And there you have it. If he'd have had arms, he'd have saved it. Now, there is no point beating around the bush. This game is not that attractive to look at. It doesn't feel particularly engaging. Now, Waddington's back in 65 didn't really help themselves because the paint finish on these players is frankly desperately poor. And for a company with their reputation, I'm surprised they were allowed to leave the factory. But as with anything, particularly when you have an art director like Nicky around, with a lick of paint and a little bit of an imagination, this game can be transformed into something rather jolly. Together, marvellous chaps at Waddington's were not the first to see the potential of evolving tiddlywinks into tabletop football. Oh no, in the 1950s, Berwick Games gave us this. Shoot, this was massive in the period. Glorious, vivid box art, testimonials from all the great football stars of the day around the side of the box, but they ultimately belie the fact that when you take the lid off, what's inside is tiddlywinks. 11 counters versus 11 counters, a disc for a ball, and really not tabletop football. But we forgive them because it was the 1950s. In 1978, which only feels like yesterday, Waddington's blatantly copied shoot with this, the Waddington's football game. Now, admittedly, it was at a pocket money price, but again, when you take the lid off, this is just counters v counters and a little disc for a ball. Not really tabletop football. So, the ultimate winners of evolving tiddlywinks into tabletop football is Waddington's 
table soccer. Now I've got a soft spot for this game because it's the first table football game I ever had way back in 1969. And if you want to add a game like this to your collection in half decent playable condition, then you're gonna be forking out 20 to 30 pounds. But that's not the reason we're talking about it. The reason is it gives us a chance to see where tabletop football was in 1965. And more importantly, it's Waddington's. Two years later, at the end of 67 and into 1968, they bought Subutio, and we all know where that led. Nice bit of business, boys. There's a good ball played in for Tony Morley. Oh, he must be! And it is! Peter Will! I know it's the holiday season, and I know the last thing you need is to listen to our personal problems. But something happened in our control room last week while we were preparing for this show that could have torn the very fibre of Table Football Monthly. Somebody, and we're not mentioning any names, mentioned the S word in the studio last week. And that word was... Soccer! Can you believe it? The clue is in the title. Table Football Monthly. But it got us arguing, as we do every few months, which is correct? Soccer? Or football? apologise for saying the word soccer. It's totally legitimate and it's been around since 1888. There is treachery afoot in the studio. Can you believe it? The thing is, yes, there is a degree of leg uh, legitimacy to soccer, but ultimately it's an abbreviation of the word association. ASOC, it's, it, it's gone out of fashion. So have you. <laughs> that is so harsh. That is so harsh. Look, you can't call a game association. It's like table, Subutio table association, table soccer. Ranting. But. Oh, much as it pains me to admit it, Danielle is right. Neither football nor soccer is more relevant to the naming of the nation's favorite game than the other. Way back in the early to mid 19th century, football was played throughout the land, but there was a problem. No one played the same rules. Some teams kicked the ball, some teams picked it up and ran with it. Others threw it. And so it was in 1863 that a gentleman with the wonderfully colorful name of Ebenezer Cobb Morley gathered together a few chums in London to thrash out some crystallized rules so that teams could play a common game of football. This meeting created the Football Association. Finally, we had a name for our favorite game, Association Football. Fabulous. 20 years later in Oxford, a student named Charles Reefer Brown was known for having a rather charming habit. He would shorten or abbreviate words and add ER to the end just for a laugh. This meant that rugby became rugger. Breakfast became brekkers. Now in the uh, Oxford English Dictionary, association was abbreviated as ASOC. So it's no great stretch of the imagination to see how Mr. Reeford Brown would have created the word soccer. And this went down very well with elite fans of the game. Right from there through to the end of the Second World War, soccer was common usage. Now in table Football terms, this becomes jolly interesting. You will never see a better illustration of the difference between the elitist view of soccer and the working class view of football than in these 
famous table football games. Bill Keeling, based up in the northwest in working class Liverpool, incorporated the name football into his tabletop game, New Footy. In 1947, in the southeastern suburbs, Tunbridge Wells, Peter Adolf used the more elitist word soccer in his table football game. But during the 50s, the game moved towards the working classes. And this is seen in old Pathé news coverage of big matches. The spectators are wearing cloth caps, they're smoking woodbines. These are blue collar factory workers. Football became a far more common word. That has carried on right into the present day to a point where we can see this splendid map. I'd love to credit it, I found it on the internet, but sadly, I don't know who created it. But whoever it was, many, many thanks. You'll see the areas in pink indicate where in the world football is more commonly used or its derivative. Whereas the areas in blue show where soccer is more prevalent. The areas in green show countries where they develop their own name for the game. So the simple answer, the simple answer to the question, is the game football or soccer, is that it has been both. It is only social change and common usage over the decades that have made one more popular than the other. Now, whilst we've been talking about the old days in the 19th century and the creation of the Football Association, here's Smithy and Danielle to share a couple of interesting facts from those old days that you can bore your friends with over Christmas. The first association football derby game was played between the Nottingham clubs, County and Forest, in 1866. Sheffield fans will argue that it was between United and Wednesday, but this is not strictly true. The game between Sheffield United and Hallam was played in the 1850s and not under FA rules. The Sheffield Wednesday, as a club, were not formed until 1867, a year after the Nottingham derby. The first international match was played between Scotland and England in 1872 in Kilmarnock. And if you're interested, it ended nil-nil. All right, all right. I can hear you saying, Keith, this is all very interesting. But what has it got to do with table football? Well, allow me to tell you, it creates a dubious link that allows us to go back to the creation of Sabutio way back in 1947 and take a look at how the rules Peter Radolf created back then crystallised the rules that many of us are still playing today. We don't just throw this rubbish together. Many of us know that Sabutio, from its inception in 1947 through to the modern day, has evolved hand in glove with changes to the actual game. And so have the rules. With real association football, in the early days, the introduction of a solid crossbar, changes to the throw-in rule, the offside law, right up to modern day changes like the pass-back rule and VAR, the same as occurred with Subutio. This folded piece of A4 contains the rules for the very first Subutio table football game, whereas this is the Federation of International Sports Table Football's current rule book, a short novel. And much with VAR, we don't always feel that rules have evolved for the better. But that is an argument for another program. This is one of the earliest games of Subutio table football. And you don't need to be a genius to calculate that a football pitch would not fit in this small box. What did was this leaflet. And on the inside front cover, you are advised to find a smooth but thick blanket and a piece of chalk and create a pitch to the dimensions outlined below. Most strongly recommended was an old army blanket. Well, Table Football Monthly has only gone and tracked down an original World War II army blanket, and we are going to make this happen, and we're going to make it happen now. Where's my ruler? The tools for the job are laid out. A long ruler, box of chalk, and the blanket. Pitch dimensions to hand, and away we go. A goal line, touch line, then the centre line with a carefully drawn centre circle. Before you know it, a workable, if slightly rushed, pitch. Truth told, it works well. Reminds me of muddier pitches of yesteryear. It must have been so exciting in the late 40s to be able to recreate the real game 
so realistically. Like all the best series, we want to leave you on a cliffhanger. We will pick up this story and the post-war battle between New Footy and Savuccio in January's edition. Busy, busy, busy. And yet we've still got oodles, oodles to get through. So the next on our bumper Christmas menu is a competition we mentioned last month, and that is Goal of the Year. And we have got our gorgeous prize. This amazing trophy. It really is a stunner. And thanks to Peter, thanks to Peter. It's so stunning that Danielle won't let go of it. A massive, massive thanks to Peter Marshall at the Subutio Solo Fantasy League for kindly donating it to us. It is a thing of beauty. Now, admittedly, we didn't give you an awful lot of notice, but enough of you managed to send in an entry that we can still run the competition. So thank you very much for all of you who have taken part. Now, we have gone through these goals. Danielle, a massive, massive mine of information on all things football and baking. Uh, Smithy, equally so, on all things football and brewing. Uh, the fantastic Peter Marshall at the Subutio Solo Fantasy League. And the equally lovely and fluffy Pete Whitehead at Subutio World. Now, we have gone through these goals in great detail. Ultimately, we're not looking for anything. We just want a goal that goes, ooh! There is one that goes, ah. We like that one a little bit as well. But yeah, we want a goal that goes, ooh. So here they are in ascending order. There we have it. The winner of our first Table Football Monthly Goal of the Year competition is Clinton Garwiler. Clinton, I hope I've pronounced your surname correctly and please forgive me if I haven't. We love that goal. Very clean hit on a moving ball and it was a unanimous vote from all of the judges. Danielle Smithy, Peter Marshall and Peter Whitehead and myself. We really enjoyed looking at all the goals. Thank you for sending them through. Thanks to Peter Marshall for donating this fantastic trophy. Clinton, this is on the way to you. And I think we might try that again next year. It's now time for the Subutio Challenge. Here we are at Christmas and Chris Burford still sits atop the table with 38 points. Will the fact that he's there at Christmas mean he's still there? come to the end of the season? Well, that depends on you. If you want to come and have a bash at this challenge, contact us on the address below. Come to the studio and have a little play. This month's victim, or should I say challenger, is Adam Lundy from the old Sod Subutio Club. We took the pitch up to Droitwich and this is what happened. In there? Okay, just gently send them out. You're on the line, so we're going to give you three for that. <laughs> one for that, four. Right, you've got some work to do. Oh yeah, take your last one, sure. Four. And three, seven. Oh, you're only one beer. Yeah. Five. 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 Come on, man. Come on. Oh, we touched the cup still. Keep going, real right. Oh, oh, right, when you're ready. Yes! yes. Right. How you do it? And With the three, so that's eight. eight. Come on, two more legs. Oh, oh, double tapper! Oh. Go on, still doing 16. I've got a few guys who are going to 30. Oh, yes! yes. That's on 28, Ad. I think that was the high score, mate. 28, yeah. Yeah. Off the Ooh, wall. Did that go off the wall? That's three. Yeah, that'll do. You hit the wall on the way in. Yeah, you're okay with that. 31. Go on, Ad. One to beat, mate. 
<laughs> is that what it is? Shot two. Oh. oh. Down the back, back by the boxes. Oh, was it? No, well, we saw the play by missing, so that's fair. That's fair play, last shot. Oh. How unlucky was that? Let's take a look again. So close, the difference between top of the table and second. Desperately bad luck. 31 points for Adam, putting him equal second with his clubmate Richard. And above them both, still with what's looking like an increasingly impressive score of 38, we have Chris Burford. So here's the Christmas table. There's Chris sitting proudly at the top. If you'd like to see your name at the top of that table, by the end of the season, which will be our May edition. Then drop us a line and come and have a go. Well, that just about wraps it up on our bumper Christmas edition of Table, Table Football, Football Monthly. Monthly. We hope uh, you've enjoyed it. We want to say a big sincere thank you to all of you, yes, for, su thank you. Yeah, for supporting the program through the last six months. And we're looking forward to seeing you again in 2020. Now, I promise you, on behalf of all of us. We have been in the production office, working our fingers to the bone. 24 seven. Day and night, you're right, day and night. Trying to find things to make next year's programme even more ambitious and exciting. So the, all that remains for Danielle, who will appear, God, it's like magic. Look at that. Smithy and for me. Whatever you're doing over the next few weeks, have the best and most relaxing holiday, and we will see you next year. Happy Christmas! Christmas! Log fires burning See the Christmas lights are twinkling Wondering what Santa's bringing Now we know it's Christmas time It's Christmas time Away Christmas Day